Hi. Welcome to Drinking the Kool-Aid. Welcome. I'm Megan. I'm Hannah. And today we're going to cover a case that I watched on Dateline. Okay. Um, It was season 31, episode 10. Jeez. I know. They have so many. Uh, and it's called The Figure in the House. Okay. Yeah. So. Well, that is not great. Yep. If that gives you any indication, hopefully no one's home alone and listening to this You right know, now. I literally just asked her before we started this <laughs> to make sure that it wasn't going to be anything super, super, like, I mean, obviously it's going to be awful. It's the, or it's, you know, it's a true crime podcast, but yeah. I was like, just... Be nice, because I've been having some real messed up dreams lately, and I just bled out in one of them. And great, now I'm going to be having dreams about, like, being chased in my house while I'm home alone, so that's awesome. Yeah, she texts me and goes, is this one brutal? And I respond, well, there's a murder. Okay, but you knew what I meant. (laughs) I mean, come on. Yeah, I know there's a murder, but I mean, like, is it like, you know, some of them are like extra freaking brutal and like have a lot of details Mm -hmm. that tend to embed into my brain. And it's just my dreams have been real not good. (laughs) Well, this should really help you. Sweet. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Yay. Nan Yao Su and Jill Halliburton met in Japan. She was an exchange student and he was teaching. He left to do a Ph.D. in the States, and she left to travel in Southeast Asia. About two years later, Nanya received a postcard in the mail from Jill, and she was volunteering in Cambodia. The two of them kept in touch and ended up getting married. They adopted their daughter, Mandy, and they had Justin three years later. Jill was a dedicated mother, and she was passionate about doing volunteer work. When she first came back to the States, she worked with refugees from Southeast Asia. Oh, that's cool. It's so cool. And then years later, she volunteered to make these audio tapes for the blind by reading books and magazines. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So that it was like actually really fucking cool. Really, really awesome, genuine work, you know? The family had always been close. But in 2014, there was some tension going on. Justin had dropped out of college, and his father was pretty upset about this. This was like a really big no-no in their family. On September 7th of 2014, Jill Halliburton Sue and her husband, Nan Yao Su, arrived home from a trip to Malaysia. They lived in a $1.2 million home Whoa. in a gated community in Davie, which is 11 miles southwest of Fort Lauderdale. Whoa. Huge. I was way <laughs> off on that. When you said one, I was thinking like one bedroom apartment or some shit, and they were like no, using no. all their money to travel. Ooh. Holy hell. Yeah. So, okay. Lots of money flowing here. The next morning, Nan Yao headed to work at the University of Florida. He is an entomologist, which means he studies insects, their environments, and their behaviors. All right. Mm-hmm. It's actually kind of intriguing. Yeah. Jill slept in that morning, but she was up at 9.30 a.m. when her son, Justin, left the house. He saw her sitting in the living room in her pink robe reading a book. Justin said goodbye and told her he was heading to work. He had a part-time job at the same university as his father and was a professor's assistant. Shortly after noon, he got a call from his father and he said, Are you home right now? Justin said, No, I'm at work. Why? Nanyao said he was in his office and he saw something weird on the home cameras. Oh. So he initially thought... That it was his son, Justin, pulling a prank on him. And he asked Justin, he was like, can you just run home and check because the cameras just went out? Are you going to, like, tell me the weird thing that he saw? Yes, I am. Okay. (laughs) I was like, you can't leave me hanging. No, here it is. All right. So the cameras had been flickering. That's why he was paying attention when he was in his office because he sees this happening. And when he looked over, he caught something that went by real fast. Uh Uh-oh. Okay. So. I'm getting nervous. Ah! All right. 
on the live feed, oh, he God. saw oh, God, a oh, figure God. in the kitchen of their home. Oh, no. Wearing a mask. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, oh no. And so that's oh, can why you he... imagine being not at home seeing right. that, knowing your like spouse is home? So like his first instinct is, OK, Justin's playing a prank because he knows that his father watches these cameras. Yeah, trying to scare him or something. Exactly. He saw someone walk from the kitchen to the breakfast area, then disappeared from view. Then the image was lost. Oh, God, that's even worse. Yeah, because now you don't know what's going on. Yes. Oh, okay. So Nanyao calls his wife, but Jill didn't answer. So Justin sped home, and it took him about 15 minutes to arrive. Probably the longest 15 minutes in the universe. Yeah, ever. He entered the house through the garage, and when he got inside, he saw something was very wrong with the cameras. The first one he looked at had been ripped out of the wall, and the wires were dangling. He looked at the living room, and same thing happened to that camera. So Justin's first thought was, why is my mom going crazy and ripping the cameras down? What happened? He goes upstairs to his room and noticed that someone had been rifling through all of his drawers. He was an avid hunter and diver who collected knives and blades, and they were missing. He could hear water running in his parents' bathroom, and when he got there, he saw that the tub was full to the rim. Oh, God. The water was red with blood. Yep. And his mother's body was floating in the hot water, and she was face down. Justin calls his dad and said that he thought his mom had killed herself, and then he called 911. He told the operator the same thing. His mom killed herself. He quickly pulled her out of the tub. He got drenched in her blood. Give it like, where is the person? Right. Sorry. I'm Who knows? Out. I'm I know. I'm freaking out. I know. Um, and he started CPR. Once Jill's body was out of the tub, he reassessed the situation and realized this was not a suicide. He told the dispatcher that this was a murder because her hands and legs were tied. Jill's hands had been bound with a cloth belt and her feet was bound with an electrical cord and she had been stabbed more than 20 times. Oh my god. The detectives were immediately suspicious of Justin's story. His mom had been bound and stabbed. How could that even look like a suicide? Uh, hello? (laughs) When you're in a freaking panic mode, anything can look like anything. Right. And I think that sometimes you want it to be that versus somebody actually, like, murdering. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I can see where your first instinct is like, you know, you're not thinking that somebody came into the house and murdered your mother. No, and your brain is not going to be thinking very clearly anyways. Right. So they came to a theory right away when they learned that Jill's maiden name was Halliburton. She was the descendant of a rich and prominent family in the American oil business. Maybe she was murdered for her money. Her great-uncle, Earl Halliburton, had once been among the wealthiest people in America. His wealth came from developing and improving the process of extracting oil from the ground. When Earl died, oil rights were distributed to all the family members, so Jill didn't actually get very much of it. In fact, her son Justin said he got a royalty check for $13 because he was so far down in the family line. So Jill did not get very much. Yeah. (laughs) Nanyao had developed termite traps that were widely used. So that's how the family got their money and lived so comfortably was because of him. Oh, interesting. Yes. Oh, because he works with insects. Exactly. He studies them. Of course, he could Mm -hmm. make something like that. Oh, that's freaking cool. (laughs) The night before the murder... Nan Yao and Jill had returned from that trip to Malaysia, where he was giving a lecture. Jill was exhausted, so that's why she decided that she was going to sleep in the next morning. Homicide detective Paul Williams said he will never forget the crime scene, and it was one of the most horrific he had seen in his 28 years. 
When he arrived to the house, he saw Justin sitting outside on the ground under a tree. There was mulch on the ground, and he was punching it repeatedly. EMTs were attempting to calm him down. When his dad pulled up, his first instinct was, of course, to go hug his son. But the police said no. They could not be near each other, and the two of them had to stay separated. Oh, because they could yep. talk if it was that. Okay, yeah. Detectives were looking at Justin as the main suspect right away. Near the front door, a knife was lying on the ground. It belonged to Justin. To him, because he was a hunter. Mm-hmm. And it had traces of blood on it. Once the tub was drained... A large hunting knife was found at the bottom. You know what the shitty part is, is that his fingerprints are going to be all over it all. Of course, because it belongs to him. And the knife that they found in the bottom of the bathtub was a knife that Jill had gifted to Justin. Oh, no. To, like, make things oh, even worse. no. I know. That's so sad. Okay. Yeah. The alarm panel box was also at the bottom of the tub, so it had been, like, ripped down and tossed in there. Justin was brought in for questioning, and he cooperated and never asked for a lawyer. He told them the same story that we've already been through, but there was one difference. When his dad called him about the problem with the security camera, Justin said he was at work. But when he explained the story to detectives, he said he got the call when he was at the library. Okay, but in hindsight, some people <laughs> sure. will say they're going to work. Absolutely. When they're just trying to get away. Uh-huh. I mean, so I'm just saying, I'm just pointing <laughs> that out. Yeah. No, that's a, a valid point. Um, So this was a community library at the college where he was taking classes. Turned out... Both of these accounts were lies. Well, son of a bitch. <laughs> Once he was called out on this, Justin changed his story and said, okay, I was actually sleeping in my car. <laughs> when I can see your face. Yeah, I'm very confused. Yeah. When Justin dropped out of college, it caused huge problems with the family. And he said he just did not want to disappoint his father. So that's why he said he was at work when his dad called him. Because well, that's what I was saying. Yeah. I mean, that's where they expected he would be. His dad told him that he needed to go to school and work part time. So he used both of those in his lies. But when he fessed up, he said he was really sleeping in his car in the school parking garage when his dad called. Ever since he moved back into the house, they had all been fighting a lot, and that's why he initially thought that his mom took her own life. Actually, that kind of checks. Yeah, all right. Yeah, I, I mean, see. it was stressful. Yeah. Things had just been difficult in their relationship. You know, it was new territory for them. Even though the home was in disarray, it looked like it was staged. It didn't feel like a burglary gone wrong. There was one glaring problem with the crime scene when detectives started to look at things. Was there expensive things around still? Well, there was, but that wasn't the main problem. The only room that had been rifled through was, was Justin's. Justin's. Yeah. So that's a problem. Well, shit. I mean, sure, the cameras had been pulled down around the house, but the drawers in his room had been opened Items had been right. moved, and two of his knives were used in the murder. Like, that does not look good. Then there was a third knife that popped up. Justin said he had a knife with him, and he explained during the interrogation that he grabbed it from his car, and he went in the house to check on his mom or see what's going on with the cameras. But the knife was found in his car. After finding his mother dead, like, why would he go back to put the knife in his vehicle? That doesn't really make sense. Justin admitted that he lied again. And he said he was trying to make it look like he was being safe. Detectives were starting to wonder if maybe Justin and his mother fought that morning. And he tried to stage it and make it look like a robbery gone wrong. Justin was like, no, I had nothing to do with this. It was obviously a break-in. He even knew where the intruder came in. 
What? Yeah. So he tells them that there is an opening on the back door. And, I mean, there was. But when police looked at it, they felt like it was too small for a grown man to fit through. Okay. Detectives left Justin alone several times during the interview, and he would start talking to himself, pacing, crying, and yelling profanities. His father, Nanyao, was left in the room next door to him. So he had to sit in Could there. Could he hear him? Oh, yes. Oh, no. So he has to sit on the other side of this wall and listen to his son crying and screaming. That has got to be torture. And he can't do anything about it. Nanyal was interviewed, and he said that he saw the person for about two to three seconds on the camera. The person he believed was a white male, and he was tall and skinny. Detectives were like, well... Your son is it's tall, tall and, skinny. and skinny. Ah, damn it. So, Nanya was shocked, and he tried to tell them that it was not his son that he saw. It was an intruder. Detectives went back to Justin, and they said, look, your dad just described seeing you on the camera. They told him that his father suspected him of being the killer. Justin said, no, someone's trying to frame him. And detectives used this to their advantage. So they were like, okay, and they switched tactics here. They said the only one who could frame him was his father. Son of a bitch. So they interrogated Justin for 11 hours. And at one point in the interview on Dateline, you could hear Justin saying, quote, when you guys find out you're wrong, I hope you come and say sorry to me, man, or something. And the detective responded, quote, if I find out I was wrong, I'd seriously consider a career change, but I know I'm not wrong. Well, if he is wrong, I hope he considered that career change. (laughs) I guess we'll find out. (laughs) I'm really, I don't know, man. This one's got me right now. I know. Because it's starting to look real bad. You can see it. But also the lies that, Mm -hmm. like, he's telling actually, like, kind of make sense. They could. You know what I'm saying? Depending on which way you look at it. No, and they could, like, I get why he would be like, oh, yeah, I took the knife in with me because I'm trying, like, he's trying to make it look like he was fucking safe. But I also get, like, you need to tell the damn truth in these situations. But, like. Yeah. Also, he's, you know, it's just, I don't know. I'm very torn on this one already. Right. And I know that people always, you know, look at someone's behavior, which we always say, ah, you can't do that. But if you were to, maybe you would think he's being overdramatic, sitting under a tree and punching the mulch, you know what I mean, when people are trying to keep him calm. I do not think that. But again, his mother is dead I was going to say, I absolutely do not think that, actually, because I know somebody who has been in a situation where their family member was found dead, Mm -hmm. and their spouse punched a firefighter in the face. Sure. Like, it just... And it's because they they stopped CPR. Like it's it's you can't. I don't think there's a way to control. I think your you're emotions catapulted into like another universe. Yeah, you don't even know where your brain. Yeah, flies exactly. Into. No, that's exactly it. So, but I, I mean, there is a lot of things. You're, it's kind of back and forth right now. I know when I was watching the Dateline, I was like, I don't know, kind of looks bad. But you know, is this fucking solved? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <sighs> Okay. Oh, man. All right. All right. Well, I, I will say. What? It- it's debatable. No, what? If it's solved. And we'll get to that. <sighs> yeah. It's it's very, very debatable. Um, Many, many people think that it's not correct. Oh, good. Okay. Okay. Well, I guess we'll see where we end up standing at, yeah, at yeah. the end. <laughs> Detectives were hoping to get their hands on the footage that Nan Yao saw with the supposed intruder, but no dice. The camera system, this is just the worst thing, okay? The camera system that, uh, that they had was a drop camera service, meaning you pay for a service to keep the live recordings. The family had done a trial period for the recordings that lasted no. two weeks. It was not renewed, and it expired two days before the murder. No. 
Yeah. Like the then, timing is just oh. out of this world here. So there's no footage to review. It's all gone. All right. Investigators would have to start checking people's timelines, and they were starting with Justin. He said that he ran some errands that morning and left the house for the second time around 9.15 a.m. The security camera at the front gate does show his car leaving, and three hours later, around 12.30, his car re-entered the gated community. This does match his story that he was away, received a call from his father, and went back to the house to check. Detectives had determined that the murder took place slightly around noon, and Justin wasn't home. Once they realized he couldn't have murdered his mother, he was released. During the 11-hour investigation, um, or I guess interrogation, Justin did provide investigators with a new clue to pursue. He had thrown a party at his house two days before his parents returned from their Malaysia trip. Oh. Mm Mm-hmm. So here's a whole slew of new people. That's fucking big, though, because that gives somebody the time to spot where cameras are. Mm Mm-hmm. Find out about the back entrance, and it also gives somebody the knowledge of knowing that Justin has hunting stuff in his bedroom. That's true. It does. So, yeah, that's exactly where investigators were. They're like, okay, maybe one of his friends was involved in this. There were about 20 to 25 kids at this party, which I was a little surprised in the dateline that they gave 20 to 25 because I'm like, well, didn't we go through the list of people that attended? Like, which one is it? Um, Oh, yeah. That's where it's at, 20 to 25. And they were smoking and drinking. This added another issue for investigators. A party meant there was lots of extra fingerprints in the house. Yep. Every kid was brought in for questioning and an oral swab. They all knew about the security cameras in the home. When they arrived at the party, Justin told each one of them that they needed to be cool around the cameras. He showed them which areas to avoid in case his parents checked the cameras yeah, while they well, were on their go. trip. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Most of the kids at the party were Justin's close friends, but there were a few that he didn't know very well. Justin said that during the party, one of the guys went to the off-limits part of the house Justin said he yelled at him because the guy just walked into his parents' room and went to their bathroom and was on the phone. This party goer was interviewed, and he said, yeah, he got an important call and he wandered away from everybody. And then Justin saw him entering the room and asked him to go out to the garage to finish the call, and he did right away. The kids at the party seemed to mention one person that had a bad reputation. Detectives brought him in for questioning, and he said, quote, I had a feeling I would end up here just knowing the situation and shit. Okay. So. Well, that mm, is comforting. Hello to you. (laughs) He said he was on probation for drugs, and he had an alibi for the time of the murder. He was at work. None of the kids at the party seemed to be a really good lead. Nine days after the murder. All the DNA samples from the home had been analyzed and they got a hit for 20-year-old Deontay Rosiles. He had an extensive history of burglaries and his MO matched up with the crime scene. He always targeted huge homes and gated communities. They were all backed up against the water and most of the entries were through a back glass doorway. Okay, but I'm going to guess that murder wasn't. A part of those? It was not. Yeah. (laughs) The police got an arrest warrant for Deontay, and right off the bat, he said he was not talking. Detectives said, okay, well, you're being charged with first-degree murder. He was asking what they were talking about, and they said, no, no, we can't talk to you. And they walked out. He was assigned a court-appointed defense attorney. Gentry Chambers went to talk to him, and he saw a scared kid. It didn't make sense. He talks to hardened criminals for a living and would have expected somebody, you know, who was a brutal murderer to maybe act a little tougher. 
Deontay grew up close to the Sioux family. His single mother worked minimum wage jobs, and he was nicknamed Moochie as a kid. Oh, no. (laughs) He was... I don't feel like that's for a good reason. (laughs) He was charming, driven, and posted videos online that were essentially motivational. He was telling people to be ambitious and to work hard. He did have a history of burglaries, but... If he was ever caught during them, he would take off running. He didn't murder previously. On July 15th, 2016, Deontay was in court for a hearing, and during this, the courthouse was shut down and surrounded by police. It was pure chaos. Justin received a call from the victim advocates, and they said, you might want to pull over. Deontay escaped from the courtroom. Oh, fucking hell. So, he entered the courtroom that morning at 9.06. He was the first in line of inmates that were led in, and they headed towards the jury box where they went off camera. They wait there until their case is called. At 9.36, a new group of inmates was led in, and seconds later, Deontay bolted. Well, you did say he was a runner. Mm-hmm. He hit the door and someone was on the other side, so he bounced backwards. He pushed through again, and this time he got through the door. He tossed the jumpsuit on the floor, got out of the cuffs and shackles, busted out a back door, and hopped into a waiting car. I mean, I'm impressed. And we are going to break that down of how this happens later. A manhunt was launched. There was a $50,000 reward being offered, and the rumor mill went a wild. But you're going to, like, tell me how he got out of his cuffs and everything later? I am. Okay. Oh, yeah. Social media started blowing up, and hashtag free Moochie and hashtag run Moochie run was trending. <laughs> oh, sorry. yes, it was. <sighs> I know it's not a good thing, but, uh-huh. like, I don't know what it is, but when people <laughs> do, like, tags like that yeah it just gets me i know (laughs) the the community felt that the police were just trying to pin this on him because he was black he had been in trouble before but it was for burglaries he was not violent things just weren't adding up six days after his escape a new lead came in a tipster said deontay was hiding out in a day's in about an hour away And he was going to put up a fight. So they showed up with a SWAT team. Shit, I would be so much further away than an hour. Yes. I would, like, not stop traveling for a very, very, very long time. After an escape like that, you would think it would be six countries over. I don't... Not even anywhere in the vicinity. (laughs) He was taken into custody without any incident. How did Deontay escape? You're asking? Well, that's such a good question. I did ask, actually. (laughs) I know. He got help from friends and family members, and this was discovered on his recorded phone calls from jail. This plan (laughs) had been in motion for a few months, Uh, and it was mainly a group of young kids that were in on this, so that's kind of embarrassing for (laughs) police, but okay. (laughs) On the morning Uh, of the escape. Deontay was in jail, and he got a key that would unlock the cuffs and shackles. A few months prior to this moment, a deputy at the jail reported that they lost a handcuff key. It was later discovered that a jail guard had given him the key. I wondered, actually. Mm-hmm. So, this kid's persuasive. Days before the escape... Deontay was on the phone with a friend who was in the courthouse, and they were describing the exact route that he would take to get out of the building. His friend walked from the courtroom down the staircase that leads to the third floor, which leads to another stairwell that leads outside. They explained every detail of the layout to him so that he would know exactly where to go and he could do it quickly. On the morning of the escape, Deontay was patted down. And this can be seen on the surveillance cameras. He had already ripped apart the legs of his jumpsuit. So, like, on Dateline, they showed 
uh, an image of this, a little bit of the footage, and you can see the bottoms of the legs are completely torn apart. Okay. So it's a little interesting to me that he was allowed to leave like that, right. but maybe there's not rules on that specific part. Like, maybe that's okay. I don't know. Um, but he had ripped the legs to make it easier to get off. Oh. Under the jumpsuit, he was wearing street clothes. The inmates were brought to the courtroom fully shackled. One prisoner blocks Deontay's torso from view and unlatches his waist chain so his hands had room to move. When they went to the courtroom, he went to the jury box, and it's believed that he unlocked the cuffs and shackles at this point. There were two twins in the court, and they were the eyes and ears. Okay, dead ass, I feel like this is prison break right now. Yeah. Because everybody is, like, helping mm -hmm. him do that. Like, it's like so many people are in on this one person getting out. And it it's is just a little so incredible. To it. Yeah. It's really cool. Like, it, it's a very intense plan here. I mean, it's not a good thing. I'm not like, no, oh, it's really cool. Not. And yeah, do it again. No, don't do that. But I'm just saying it's, like, cool to hear the thought process and everything behind it. That somebody could come up with this sitting in a jail cell and right. get every piece to and work every correctly. Person, every yeah. person to, to agree to it. Yeah. So the twins are sitting in court and they were communicating with the people in the car. So one twin signals the other, and then that twin signals Deontay so that he knows, yes, everything is in place and he can take off. Here's how it worked. One of the twins coughed into a cell phone, and that was a message to the person in the car to let them know Deontay was on his way to the vehicle. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I would be so fucked if that's what they told me to do because I clear my throat and cough every so two often. seconds. Yeah, for real. <laughs> I would do it without even thinking, and You'd all be like, of a oh, sudden, shit. I'd be like, "Oh crap! There's nothing I can do now." Just like stand up. That wasn't the signal. <laughs> let my me bad, try again. Guys. Reset. <laughs> yeah, you're Next not the I'd person. Be like, I'd be like, "Kaka!" In court. <laughs> <laughs> yikes oh man so hannah's not the one to call no no you know i am not <laughs> also she laughs when she's nervous that's also true <laughs> like really bad Obnoxiously. like really really bad yeah and so like then i would be like cough laughing yeah because then i'd realize what i do. it would be a fucking disaster <laughs> let's be honest um uh. but his was not Right, clearly, <laughs> he was not laughing. Every detail was so planned out. But <laughs> with all of this planning, here's the funny part. Um, the getaway car didn't even have enough gas. Oh, my God. <laughs> so maybe they didn't think they would actually get away with this and pull it off. But they had to stop at a gas station after they got it. To, like, roll up, and they're like, ah, <laughs> shit, I'm on E. Yeah. I should have gotten gas this morning like I meant to. Uh, Why did I drive past it last night and tell myself I was going to get it in the morning? Never. It never happens. Just get it now. Yeah. You're never going to want to do it in the morning. Uh. All eight of the people that helped him escape were later charged and convicted. Right. I figured. Yes. Just wanted to be sure. <laughs> Once he was in custody, he wrote a letter to the judge. He apologized for escaping and said that he hoped the judge didn't take it personally. And he <laughs> hoped that he could be judged fairly. <laughs> so... Yeah, I could. I mean, shit. Yeah, don't take it personally. I escaped. I just nothing personal. Wanted out of here. It had <laughs> nothing to do with you, though. Well, he said that he greatly respected the judge, but felt that his voice was going unheard, and he wanted to prove his innocence. He knew his actions were wrong, but he was trying to gather evidence to help himself. Okay, he is like pretty convincing i could see how he got so many people involved right right he said there was a phone that could prove what he was saying if it could ever be found while he was in the motel room he was actually hanging out with friends and looking at porn sites yeah 
That so, sounds about right. That's not gathering evidence in a murder case, but okay. He started an online campaign to keep himself alive, and he recorded a message where he said, quote, If you have been placed in a jail for a crime you know nothing about or never committed, would you sit in jail? Let me answer it for you logically. No. I mean, really, he is convincing. He is. He's good at it. He, he, g- that was good. Yeah, I, I agree. No one knows who paid for this. But in 2019, a billboard was put up right in front of the sheriff's office that had a picture of Jill and Deontay. Stop. It said, Two victims, one truth. Who murdered Jill Halliburton? Who framed Deontay Resiles? Join us. Hashtag justice for Moochie. Oh my god! Yeah. This is getting juicy! (laughs) Yeah. I just... uh, I personally would not have put them on the billboard together. Wouldn't Um, be there. But this is getting juicy. Right. Especially when we don't know, you know, the Right in front of the sheriff's office? Yeah. Wow. It's it's ballsy. They... For sure. Really got some big ones. Yes. Yeah. The trial finally took place in late 2021, and Deontay pleaded not guilty to first-degree murder. Deontay's DNA was found in three separate places at the crime scene, on a belt, outside the house on one of Justin's knives, and at the back door point of entry. This sounds like a pretty open and shut case, but the lab that processed the DNA had a history of controversy. And I was also going to say, does it, though? Because typically when it sounds perfectly cut like that, Mm -hmm. it's not usually (laughs) the the case. I mean, it it depends. Because normally in a case, I'm like, hey, if DNA is there, that's your guy. He was not at a party. He he didn't attend the party. He wasn't one of the party goers with Justin. He was not Justin's friend. He had no relation to them. So his DNA should not be in the house. Okay. So that's why it's like, okay, open and shut. Maybe, maybe not. According to the prosecutor, in 2015, the BSO lab was accused by a local expert of mishandling how they calculated the statistics of how often in a population it is likely that they would find similar DNA. Deontay's defense attorneys latched onto this and used it to their advantage during the trial. They argued that the real killer was actually... Justin Sue, just like the investigators originally thought. They pointed out that he lied several times and he had erratic behavior. The did jury he say that on the camera it was a white person. They did. Yes. Now, to be fair, he saw so it was flickering right on the screen and he saw 2 to 3 seconds. So, it's very difficult to be positive that he saw a right. white person, no, and I he just, said they were wearing a mask. Yeah, I was just thinking about that yeah. as you were just, like, talking about mm-hmm. And I was like, wait a second. Yeah. But, okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. Going, sorry. So the jury deliberated, and on day five, they came back with a verdict. Deontay was guilty of manslaughter, not first-degree murder, so his sentence would be considerably less. The judge pulled each juror to ask them if this was their verdict, you know, standard procedure, and he started with the foreperson, who is the spokesperson of the jury. Is this your verdict? No. Oh, my God. Mm Mm-hmm. The juror said that minutes earlier, she had been disturbed by the reaction at the defense table when they announced the manslaughter verdict. She said, quote, I just got a knot in the pit of my stomach. I looked at the at the defense table. They were just cheering and patting him on the back like he had graduated high school or made the winning touch ball at touch ball touchdown. (laughs) I didn't. It didn't even phase me. (laughs) A touchdown at a football game. I thought, what have I done? Is this the world I'm creating for my children? A world where someone can get away with murder because of the color of their skin? 
She felt that Deontay should have received a harsher punishment, and she instantly felt better for speaking up. She explained that, unfortunately, the jurors were very divided, and the dividing issue was race. This was all happening after the murder of George Floyd. So, oh, yeah. Oh, shit. The country was in debate over racial justice. So bad. And this deeply affected the way that the jury felt. One of the jurors started crying and said that he could not send another young black man to jail. They had been sequestered for five days, arguing over the verdict, and some of them finally caved and went with the lesser charge just because they felt pressured. The judge pulled the jurors back into the jury room, and things got heated. The foreperson that changed her answer to no said that she felt threatened by another juror. He told her if he saw her in the streets, he would smack her in the face. What the hell? Yeah. And so the judge had no choice but to declare a mistrial, which, like, this is insanity to me, that the jurors are actually threatening each other. This is a very big decision, and it's not something to take lightly. No, it's not. And this it's is not someone's something... life. Right. And it's not something you should be so stuck on your decision that you're like, oh, I'm going to slap you in the street. No, you need to talk it out with them. Absolutely. That is your job. You're there for that specific reason. So... I'm really happy that she stood up for herself and said, like, no, I was pressured into this. Three months later, a new trial started. The state presented their theory about what they think happened, and it goes like this. Deontay broke into the Sioux home and unexpectedly came across Jill and they started fighting. At some point, Jill tried to run outside, and around noon, a neighbor said they heard an unsettling cry coming from the house. She said that it was high-pitched, shrieking. Then she saw a light-colored object at the front door, then it went back inside. The neighbor believed that it was their dog, but the state says no. That was Jill screaming as Deontay dragged her back inside. Um, this is all allegedly, by the way. Right. <laughs> Just want to make sure. If this neighbor is correct in seeing something at the front door of the home at noon, Justin and his father, Nanyao, were not home at this time, and that has been verified. If that front door opened and closed at noon, Jill was still alive at that time. Assuming that it was, in fact, Jill at the door, the state believes Deontay may have hit her in the back of the head to knock her out. The knife that was used to stab Jill had a sharp edge at the end of the handle, and the medical examiner said an injury on Jill's head matched that shape. Once she was unconscious, unconscious, <laughs> she was dragged to the bathroom and murdered. There is very little blood around the bathroom, which shows that she was stabbed in the bathtub. When it comes to the DNA found on the broken glass door, which would have been the point of entry into the home, the analyst said, quote, The DNA results are at least 2.33 quadrillion times more likely if they originated from Deontay Rosiles. That's a big number. Big, big, big number. Yep. In this second trial, the state really focused on the fact that he had escaped from the courtroom because they felt that it showed his guilt. After his capture, he tried to elicit friends to help him with an alibi for the day of the murder. He bribed a corrections officer to get him a phone smuggled into the jail. He used this to start contacting his friends, but he didn't know that the phone was tapped. He asked one friend to lie for him and said that he was in and he wanted them to say that he was in Georgia, not Florida, on the day of the murder, which was on September 8th. So in this conversation, you can hear him telling the friend to say that he headed to Georgia on the 3rd and came back on the 9th. But his own phone records prove he was in Florida the whole time and he was in Florida when Jill was murdered. He also asked one friend to lie about his DNA at the crime scene. 
They were trying to spin a story where some guy got in a fight with Deontay, cut him, took his blood, and planted it at the crime scene to frame him. But there's a big problem with that story. The DNA found on the belt, knife, and door was not from blood. Oh. The defense believes that Deontay was not the one who murdered Jill because his DNA was not in the bedroom or the bathroom where she was murdered. They say that DNA survived in the bathtub, but Deontay's wasn't found there or on any of the handles where the water was turned on. Also, the murder weapon that was found in the bottom of the tub did not have his DNA either. The prosecutor disputes this and says it's absolutely possible for the DNA to dissipate in water. The defense presented other possible suspects, and that included the kids that attended Justin's party and Justin himself. When Nan Yao described the person he saw on his home security system, he believed the person was white. He only saw them for two to three seconds, and the person was wearing a mask, but either way, Deontay is black. Nan Yao pointed at Deontay and said, quote, The real evil looks like that. That is the face of evil sitting there, and evil like you should not be allowed to roam among us. He said, quote, At that moment, the loving mother of two, devoted wife of me, and the very giving, forgiving person is nothing but a piece of meat on a chopping block in front of you. You killed her with cold blood. His son, Justin, addressed Deontay on the stand and said, quote, The only person on the entire planet that knows the last words of my mother is that psychopath right there. We'll never know what it was. She was probably screaming in pain. The jury deliberated for three days, and they found Deontay guilty of first-degree murder. Nan Yao and Justin were consulted about the sentence because first-degree murder could either result in life in prison or the death penalty. Nan Yao says his wife Jill would never want another life taken. At sentencing, the state took the death penalty off the table so Deontay would receive life in prison without parole. Nan Yao said, quote, After this today, Deontay resiles, I'm going to erase you from my memory. In my mind, you are persona non grata. You do not exist. And we're going to make sure we live happily for the rest of our lives while you rot in jail. Justin told Deontay that all his friends and family will slowly fade away and forget about him. Deontay was able to respond, and he spoke for 25 minutes, and he said, quote, I don't possess the hate or rage inside of my heart to commit such a heinous crime. He said he was just another wrongfully convicted black man. He addressed the Sioux family, saying he was raised with principles and morals. Quote, I would never take a wife from her husband. I would never take a mother from her child. There is so much controversy with this case, and many people believe that Deontay did not have anything to do with the murder, and he is being set up. In the Dateline episode, we were led to believe that the BSO lab that tested the DNA in the case was only making some errors in numbers or statistics, but I don't actually think that's the whole truth. Um, I did a little Google in on this. A complaint was filed against the lab by a whistleblower, Boynton Beach forensics analyst Tiffany Roy, who was hired to retest a DNA sample swabbed from a knife handle in 2015. She felt the BSO was saying certain samples were complete enough to use in trials, but they weren't. The lab was using incorrect or incomplete DNA to charge defendants with crimes. What? Yeah. And this is... Very unsettling. One, yeah. I mean, obviously. Once this happened, the lab was forced to reopen as many as 2,000 closed cases. Whoa. And then they changed their software. And the they were using a software, which we actually coincidentally talked about in a recent episode on here. Um, so they were using a software called STR Mix that deciphers DNA evidence that was previously considered too incomplete to actually interpret. The problem is that this isn't widely used, so hardly anyone knows how this works, but that seems to work to the lab's advantage. 
they can keep everything under wraps and attorneys aren't able to get independent experts to verify the results. Oh, come on. So I want to say, like, I'm not accusing this lab of anything. I'm just telling you the information that I'm finding. Right, 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 And it's very scary to me. Yep. The Sioux family got a bench in a park dedicated to Jill, and it's embossed with her artwork. And I want to end by reading her obituary that I found to give a good sense of who she was. Quote, March 16th, 1955 to September 8th, 2014, Jill Halliburton Sue of Davie, Florida, was born in Whittier, California, and moved with her family to Michigan in 1966. Jill was a graduate of Michigan State University and was a longtime resident of Broward County. She was a loving wife, mother, daughter, sister, and friend to all. She was full of life and touched many people through her artwork and special way of creating or finding that perfect thrift shop discovery for just the right person. Jill enjoyed combing thrift stores for that unique piece of wood that would become her next art creation. Jill exhibited her art for over a decade at the Ann Arbor, Michigan Art Fair each summer. She had a dedicated following. She was also a longtime respected volunteer and member at Insight for the Blind and the 1919 Club, a study club. Jill was a devoted wife to Dr. Nanyao Su, whom she met while studying abroad at Michigan State University in Japan. She was the consummate hostess and made everybody welcome in her home. Jill traveled all over the world with her husband and family. Her most recent trip with Nanyao was to Malaysia. Jill was the loving mother of two children, Mandy and Justin. She was always a volunteer for their classrooms and mentor to other children. The teachers could always count on her. She could make us all laugh with her wry sense of humor or knowledge of trivia and movies. Jill had a genuine curiosity about many things and could amaze you with what she knew about most anything. Jill was an amazing organizer, even if you didn't want to be organized. She would still organize your cabinets for you. Her loving spirit and light were blessing to all who knew her, and she will be greatly missed. She would still organize your cabinets for you. <laughs> even if you didn't want it. That's so sweet. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. Ugh. So, I mean... It's like I said, it's solved, but it's unsolved, which is awful because so many people genuinely believe that he is not the killer. And um, there's a lot of people online that are still advocating for him. Yes, I don't want to get myself in trouble by adding too much opinion. So I'm not going to say a huge amount, but I will say that I am not convinced I would say that, to me, it's real bad if his DNA is for real in three different places inside of that home. Yes. However, I don't trust the lab now. And that is a big thing. Yes. So that would need to be proven more to me by a different lab. I think that if that were proven, I would feel more... Maybe, like, leaning towards that a little bit more that I feel a little bit better about, like, everything, but I just, I'm not 100% convinced. If the lab situation was off of the table, it would make a lot more sense to me. Yeah. But, yeah, that kind of ruined everything because now I'm just not sure if they're actually testing properly and it seems like they're being a little shady. And that's a huge freaking thing. Right. Right. Huge. that's the driving factor here of why he's right. locked up. Right. Because without that, they would have never pinpointed him. Exactly. So, yeah, it, it is very scary that that's happening. Yeah. I, yeah. So, I don't know. Um, Solved but unsolved, I guess. Okay. And that's where it, it stays for right now. All right. I hope that they do find something more concrete. Because yes. I obviously want the right person. I would really love up. for the lab situation. Yeah. To be figured out. Well, 
I'm confused as to how anything would ever run through there again. Like, yes. how are they not being shut down if this is the real deal? Um, and then to switch over after they get in trouble, they're like, oh, yeah, we actually have to retest everything. Oh, okay, we're just going to change our software. Yeah. Now nobody knows what we're doing. That doesn't give me the warm fuzzies when you're helping to lock up criminals. You're not getting warm fuzzies? I'm really not. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry Fuzzy to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> fuzzy list yeah <laughs> all right so make sure to follow us on any of your podcast apps tell us the stories you want to hear like us on facebook instagram twitter leave us a five-star review if you love us tell your friends tell your cats um bye, bye.